Good afternoon, Canucks fans, and welcome back to another episode of Canucks Conversation, brought to you, as always, by the 2024 Toyota BZ4X. BZ4X, as we talked about on yesterday's show. We had a lot of conversations on yesterday's show, Harm. Uh, like I said, the BZ4X is Toyota's brand new all-electric SUV that is designed to go the distance for you and your family. The BZ4X is packed with Toyota's coolest tech, but it still has that trusty SUV feel you know and love. And even though it's electric, it's capable of effortlessly conquering any terrain, whether it's rain, snow, mud, or your friend's questionable post-game recaps. The BZ4X will get you through it all. David Quadrelli, alongside Harmadile, our technical producer, is Grady Sass. It is a Vancouver Canucks game day, and we are excited for it because there's a lot to think about. And Harm, I, I texted you this yesterday. I said, Harmon, I need you to go over the Canucks playoff math because I was seeing these 400 character tweets from like Patrick Johnson and various people breaking it all down. And I can't follow it. I I could not follow it for the life of me. So I uh, figured it out myself, I think. And then I got you to read it over. And I think I have it right. But we need to talk about the Canucks playoff math today. Yeah, it's um, it's fascinating, right? Because Nashville... Uh, yesterday, because LA lost, they've locked themselves into the first wild card spot, and now it's all about making sure that a the Canucks hang on to the Pacific Division title, and that uh, b they don't leapfrog Dallas in the Western Conference standings. Because if they leapfrog Dallas, then they would play the second wild card team. So both of those scenarios are really outlandish long shot scenarios. So the basic premise is just you want to avoid the extremes on both ends of the equation to make sure that you lock in uh, Vancouver versus Nashville in round one. Yeah, so I have it written down and I'll make sure. Okay, so Nashville is now locked in as wildcard one, as you said. That's the big thing here. The other thing to consider is that with the Canucks playing tonight against Calgary, just an OT loss, an overtime loss would clinch the Pacific Division for the Vancouver Canucks. The only way that the Oilers can catch them at this point is if the Canucks lose to both Calgary and then Winnipeg on Thursday, which is game 82 for the Canucks, in regulation, and the Oilers win both of their games. That matchup on Saturday, we hyped it up as being a massive win and a massive potential matchup for the Vancouver Canucks, and it was. They won that matchup, and that's why they're in this position where, knock on wood, I don't want to speak in any absolutes, but they're in a good spot. They're in a good spot to close out the Pacific Division and get it done. Uh, Beyond that, to clinch Nashville as your opponent instead of LA or Vegas, if the Canucks win out and Dallas loses their last game of the season, which plays out tomorrow against the St. Louis Blues, if the Dallas Stars lose that game in regulation, the Canucks are going to win the Western Conference and face one of LA or Vegas in round two. Again, If they win out, so they win tonight against Calgary, they win against Winnipeg on Thursday, and Dallas loses in regulation tomorrow. Canucks win the Western Conference title, and then they're going to have to face one of LA or Vegas in round two. We don't like talking about favorable matchups and all that sort of stuff, but we've said a few times that Nashville is the team that you would probably like to face. You're not wishing for a playoff opponent, but... Let's be honest about what these teams are and how how the Canucks match up against these three teams. And I'm a, I know we're about to hear it in the YouTube live chat that oh well the Canucks didn't play Nashville when they were on their hot streak. Okay, they were still gearing up for that hot streak. And I think you and I have talked about that harm that they were still a good team when the Canucks faced them. And again, UC Soros is something that you obviously have to be concerned about. But I don't want to do a playoff preview here. I'm just saying that for good reason. The majority of Canucks fans I've seen on Twitter and on social media are hoping that it's Nashville that the Canucks face in round one. Yeah, and it's going to be interesting to see also the different scenarios of, for example, if the Canucks beat Calgary, then for I think you're going to want to rest your best players against Winnipeg, uh, give them an opportunity to rest up a little bit and ensure that, okay, if Dallas does lose in regulation, um, you aren't beating Winnipeg and, and passing them. And of course, no team is ever going to go in with the mindset of, We're, we want to lose tonight. In, in the last game of the season scenario, but in the event that the Canucks beat Calgary tonight and Dallas loses in regulation tomorrow, it makes a ton of sense to rest your top guys. Um, and all of a sudden the game against Winnipeg is low stakes. And the biggest concern then is just don't get hurt. 
um, and you play with that type of intensity. You know, you're, you're not going all out for every loose puck. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is I'm also curious to see from Dallas's perspective if the Canucks win tonight, right? And I'm in Dallas's situation, I'm resting as many of my top players against St. Louis as well, because even from their perspective, I mean, w- what an amazing season they're having. And I spoke to um, an NHL general manager today who said that he thinks Dallas is the best team in the NHL, his favorite to win the cup. But he was um, pointing out and kind of laughing at um, how the prize for that is as of now, they get Vegas in round one. Um, So that's pretty like, that's going to be interesting to watch as well as kind of gaming out all these different scenarios and what it means for what, what top players might uh, might appear in the lineup later down uh, later during the week. And of course you brought up the Canucks resting their players. And that's the biggest thing that I look at. I I, I know you, you have to make call-ups and you have to abide by the rules, but man, get Christian Willanden up here, get everybody you can up here. And I, I again, I know they're a little limited uh, in what they're able to do there, but man, if there's one guy that I think deserves a rest and needs a rest, it's Quinn Hughes. I, I answered it yesterday and anyone else, Thatcher Demko starts tonight against Calgary Flames. He should start again on Thursday. We don't know when the Canucks are going to start their playoffs, but we do know that the playoffs start on April 20th. Might be safe to assume that the Canucks are starting on April 21st. We don't know just yet, but that would be a Sunday night game. Uh, That's a couple days rest for Thatcher Demko. I like him having that, but for Quinn Hughes, that's the guy that I'm saying, okay, that's your MVP. That's the engine that drives your team. We know what he looks like when he's well rested compared to maybe when he's, you know, feeling the effects of playing a lot of games. And right now he's looking great. I just think a little bit extra rest, especially if you win tonight or even an OT loss tonight, get Quinn Hughes that rest more than anybody. Well, part of it too is uh, as a coaching staff, if I was in that situation, I'd be talking to the top players. If you, of course, end up in a situation where you get a point tonight and all of a sudden the game against Winnipeg has zero stakes Um, then at that point I'm having conversations with individual guys about how they're feeling physically, how they're feeling mentally, how would they potentially feel about having a night off? And, and of course the Canucks are going to have more information than, uh, than we do, right? There may be scenarios like Brock Besser, for example, uh, not too long ago has taken a couple of maintenance days. So is he the type of player that maybe you, um, let, uh, have a night off? Uh, those are conversations that, uh, the coaching staff should have with the players and sort of working collaboratively because players are also kind of particular about this kind of stuff. Some guys don't ever want to come out of the lineup um, and they, and they feel better if they're just consistently playing. And some guys may, may think, Oh, that's too long. If I'm missing the game against Thursday, that's too many days without game action for, for me to then immediately jump back into playoff hockey. So yeah, I mean, from an outsider's perspective, it it's easy for us to say, oh, Hughes or, or maybe this guy or that guy uh, should have a night off uh, on Thursday against Winnipeg. But really, this is something that the coaching staff and the players uh, should figure out internally. Speaking of guys who do not take any games off, Jeff Patterson. Jeff Patterson joins us now, the host of Rinkwide Vancouver. He is brought to you by our friends over at Greta, the home of our electric watch parties. Make Greta your spot to catch the game. Be there pregame, postgame, wherever. It's just a 10-minute walk from Rogers Arena. Make Greta your place to hang. Uh, playoff watch parties are coming, folks, and they're going to be a lot, a lot of fun. Okay, let's get to him. Jeff Patterson, the man who takes no games off. Uh, every game post game during the playoffs during the regular season jeff remember when we had to do that chicago game that's what i <laughs> that's what stands out for me this year we don't take any games off uh i do recall that one a uh, few against anaheim and well they haven't seen san jose for a while in fact i think they were done with san jose the game before christmas so maybe that was a good thing after watching the sharks uh go through i'm not even sure you can say go through the motions against edmonton <laughs> last night that was uh I don't know. I, I'm not even sure what that was. And somehow I was drawn to continue to watch it. But uh, this isn't about the Oilers or about the Sharks. This is about the Vancouver Canucks. So you're right. Game 81 of the season. Uh, home finale. And what a season it's been at Rogers Arena. A chance to get 50 wins. And of course, a chance to lay claim to that Pacific Division title tonight. We were just breaking down the playoff math, Jeff. Uh, <laughs> Nashville, we 
said is pro is the most likely opponent as well and maybe the most favorable when you look at the alternatives we're not wishing for a playoff opponent or anything like that that's not what we're here to do uh but how do you look at that in terms of the matchup for the canucks i know it's not locked yet so it might be a little premature but look the next time we talk to you jeff they're gonna have already played so we're not gonna be able to preview a series so just kind of looking at the matchup between the canucks and the nashville predators who it looks like is going to end up being the canucks opponent yeah, and yet you say that, Dave, and look, like Thatcher Demko hasn't played in five weeks. There's a possibility that he struggles tonight. The Calgary Flames have been scoring a bunch of goals. Like, it's not a guarantee. I, I figured L.A. was a match to knock off Minnesota. I just figured that uh, both the Kings and the Golden Knights would win out, and you saw what happened to the Kings. Uh, we've seen some sort of screwy results here in the last 10 days or so. And I heard you talking about, like, St. Louis and Dallas. It's like, that game, if the Canucks win tonight, that game. So, I, as much as you'd like to say, yeah, they're locked into Nashville. They're not locked into Nashville at all. I mean, the Canucks can still finish in three different scenarios. They can win the conference, they can win the division, or they could be caught by the Edmonton Oilers at the wire. So uh, I spent a lot of last night like trying to crunch numbers. And then at the end, I was like, but we're really no further ahead. We've just scrubbed a bunch of games off the schedule. Uh, it is all going to get slotted in. But if they somehow lose in a shootout or overtime tonight, that much we know that they would then uh, be in that matchup with the Nashville Predators that you wanted me to talk about. So I've taken a long and a roundabout way to get there. Uh, you know, I, I see a lot of the people that suggest that's the matchup for the Vancouver Canucks. And I, I get it, but I also can't look past the fact that Nashville just went 18 games without dropping one in regulation. Like that's pretty impressive stuff. And their top end is playing about as well as any top end of the National Hockey League. Uh, when you look at that, line with Forsberg and Ryan O'Reilly has sort of found the fountain of youth and been exactly what they hoped he was going to be in Nashville when they signed him last year I kind of rolled my eyes a little and thought like you know does he still have it but uh you know this is when you're going to see that he still has it this is in playoff time uh, I guess Nyquist's been a nice uh, pick up there and obviously Roman Yossi has just been lights out good and then you got your UC Soros so their top end uh is formidable I still wonder a little bit about the depth below there and have some questions and concerns about Nashville, but uh, Andrew Runette's obviously done a really nice job, uh, particularly in the second half of just not losing focus and keeping the eyes on the prize, which was getting into the playoffs, first of all, and getting there playing their best hockey. So, um, you know, there are no easy games. I mean, as cliche as that is, but particularly this year in the West um, and the travel. And I know it's the same for both teams, but, you know, if you're Nashville, you're probably looking at Dallas and thinking like, Man, that's an easy flight right there if we end up avoiding uh, Vancouver, but maybe Nashville wants Vancouver. I know a week ago, the Canucks looked like that team that the other teams probably would want a piece of, and yet, you know, an impressive comeback win against Vegas, and really impressive uh, work in Edmonton the other night. Uh, you know, following the blueprint that has led them to so much success, and I mentioned the chance to get to 50 wins, you know, open the scoring, extend that lead, and then just go into hyper lockdown. Like, that third period. I, I thought the third period against Vegas on home ice was impressive. Uh, and I know the others didn't have McDavid, but man, I liked so much of what I saw from the Vancouver Canucks in the late stages on Saturday night. And it was back to back and three and four for the others. There were some factors, certainly, but that's not to take anything away from the Vancouver Canucks. And it's the way that they bought into Rick Tockett's non-negotiables and his staples and the structure and just essentially ground that victory across the finish line. One of the other positives from that Edmonton game was seeing some secondary scoring in the form of Sam Lafferty and, and Pia Suter. How big of a factor do you think secondary scoring will be for Vancouver's playoff performance? Because it seems like they're a totally different team um, when they have that secondary support compared to when they don't. Yeah, I, and look, I think I've been harder on the lack of secondary scoring over the second half of the season than some. And I've been into it on social media with people that are like, look at you know, Lafferty, Sooner's in double digits, and Mikheyev's in... And I'm like, yeah, but if you're watching since Christmas, like, <laughs> you know, all those goals, like you can hold them up and I, they're there. You can't take them away. But most of the goals for those three guys came when they were playing with Elias Pedersen in the first half of the season. At various times, they were elevated. And that's where the bulk of their offense has come from. But since Christmas and really since the All-Star break, it has been a struggle. And for Pia Suter the other night, like, good for him. But then I say that and I say, like, how hard is it to go to the net with your stick on the ice and good things happen? Like, it's crazy that playing with JT Miller and Brock Besser as much as he has, uh, hasn't yielded a little bit more in the way of offense. But yeah, I mean, you'll find playoff games, Sarm, where top-end guys cancel out and it's in the third period and it's a tie game 
and you're looking for a hero. And I look up and down that Canucks lineup. And before Saturday, I would have said, like, who's that guy? Like, do you believe that Sam Lafferty is going to come through in a tie game in the playoffs? Or Pia Suter or Ilya Mikheyev, you know, and you can lump in DiGiuseppe or Pod Coles. And if he's playing and those types of guys, uh, you know, one night, it was great the other night. And it was a night when the Canucks' best players weren't really going. They just weren't for whatever reason. But you saw the ability of guys lower in the lineup to make a difference and ultimately swing a result in the Canucks' favor. So uh, I want to see more of that come playoff time. I'm not expecting a massive breakout at this stage, but it kind of feels to me like watching a lot of those guys that I just mentioned, you know, they're so focused on defense and you have to play defense under Rick Tocca. I get that, but it almost feels like they've switched the offensive switch off if you know what I mean, like they, they're not even thinking that they have to contribute. And if you're a PS shooter and you're playing, you know, you may not be a top six guy in the perfect world, but given the way the Canucks deploy their lineup, uh, he finds himself with Miller and Besser. Yeah, I think there should be a little bit of expectation on, you know, the odd contribution here and there. So it's there. You've got guys that have a track record, but, you know, ultimately it's one thing to say, hey, they've got depth scoring. It's another for that depth scoring to show up and be able to, to get the job done come playoff time. In a similar vein there, Jeff, uh, we were talking a lot about Elias Lindholm and what they were able to do as a third line with Joshua Lindholm and Garland completely shutting down the Leon Dreisaitl line in that game on Saturday. Uh, just focusing on Elias Lindholm a bit, because it feels like these are going to be the lines that we're going to see, Yeah, I hope, for the remainder of the season and into the playoffs. It seems like this is what we're going to see. Just for Elias Lindholm, what has he meant to that line, do you think? And just to this Canucks lineup since returning? Yeah, I mean, he's only been back for a couple of games. So I think he's still finding his top form and then trying to find a little chemistry with two guys that obviously uh, ooze that chemistry in Joshua and Garland. But look, we saw what that third line did with Teddy Bluger. And I just think across the board, Elias Lindholm is a better player. He's got better offensive skills if we can even see a glimpse of those. And I think he's got better defensive chops. And man, it was interesting listening to Rick, Rick talk it yesterday was asked about Elias or Elias Lindholm and like his eyes lit up. And I, I get that the offensive side hasn't been there and that his last two points, I think you both come on empty net goals. Yes. Again, for the Canucks to have an edge, you can say, Hey, they've got Elias Lindholm in their third line, but he's going to have to find a way to produce. But on the defensive side, you know, that's where talking, you could just see the excitement when he started talking about Lindholm and all the things that he does. And, Obviously, a right shot faceoff guy and a faceoff percentage that's off the charts good. You know, that's great on the penalty kill. In late game, you're trying to preserve leads, or if it's tie game, uh, you know, what a valuable tool to have there. But then talk it talked about just the IQ of some of the plays. And he said, like, these are things that you know the average fan probably isn't glomming on to, but you know, the decisions he makes, when to dive in, when not to, when to back off. And you know, again, just sort of having that hockey sense that allows him to make the right decision in real time in high leverage moments. And, and I do think that is sort of an underappreciated part of his game. Now you can say, Hey, they traded a big package of facets to get a guy that has great hockey IQ. Uh, fair enough. Like I, I think that they expected more from Lindholm uh, just in his overall performance and his ability to contribute. But if the offense hasn't been there, the defense has been really since day one and, and through a wrist injury. So to have him back, to have him healthy, um, and yeah, I mean, take on that assignment the other night against Leon Dreisaitl and absolutely win his battles and then contribute to an empty netter, uh, a big step forward. You know, he should be fired up as much as he gets fired up because he's a pretty even keel and level-headed guy, but he's got his former team here, uh, tonight in the Calgary Flames. And then, you know, the payoff ultimately is the playoffs, right? Like that's where the trade's going to be judged. It's not so much what he did or didn't do in these regular season games, but, uh, the measure of that trade and the measure of the player is going to come here starting next week against whomever they draw as a first round opponent two three weeks ago a lot of us were worried about vancouver's power play recently they bounced back seven power play goals in their last seven games what's your confidence level in vancouver's power play right now do you think they fixed their woes can't say that they fixed it harm uh, that first power play the other night in edmonton and it wasn't a full power play because there was some overlap but they couldn't even gain the zone like they never set up once barely had the puck on the power play in the Edmonton zone, uh, but certainly they didn't get a chance to set up second power play later in the game. That's the power play that I want to see. They were zipping it around. They were creating looks. They were, you know, identifying open guys and getting the puck to them. Got some shots, got some chances. So it's still sort of blowing hot and cold for me 
But I do think given where it was even 10 days ago, there has been some proof in this pudding that, you know, it's coming back and it can be a difference maker and it can swing games in their favor. So you know, I don't need them to light up the flames on the power play or even the Jets on Thursday, but I do want to see continued steps of progression here, uh, getting the reps where the power play at least looks dangerous and you're not always going to score. I mean, the best power play is what, 30%. So even if it's a 25% power play, you're failing three times for every goal that you score. But there are points in games where the power play has to come through. And I think that's been an issue, certainly since the All-Star break. The other thing is, sometimes it's not going to score, but you know, does it look good? Can it generate pressure and swing momentum in your favor? And can you follow it up with another shift or two? Like, I do think that power plays, even if they don't yield a goal, can be turning points in a hockey game. And I think that you know the second power play against Edmonton the other night it just looks so much better, so much more confident than even the first one. So it is funny within a game, you know, from power play to power play, there is still this gap of this team that's fighting it, this team that looks like it's not that confident. And then, you know, a handful of minutes later, or another period, you know, all of a sudden these guys are whipping it around like they did early in the season. So component parts are there without a doubt. And, you know, Tight games, again, like there are going to be crunch times in playoff hockey where they absolutely need a power play goal. And, you know, I, I wish I could sit here and tell you, absolutely, you know, 100% confident in them. Can't say that, but I did see some signs of life and have over the last couple of weeks at least. Jeff, Andre Kuzmenko shooting at like 26% again. So obviously people are starting to talk about him and, oh, how could they have ever traded this guy? Uh, Andre Kuzmenko, uh, coming back to Rogers Arena tonight, I don't even know how what my question really is. I just I've seen so many people, Jeff, looking at this trade now and say, "Well, Kuzmenko's scoring, Lindholm's not." Clearly, I, honestly, like the easiest way for me to put it is, it feels like both fan bases are like coping with the trade. Like, well, Canucks it, fans it, like, "Well, I'll, he's so good defensively." I'll help you out here, Dave. You don't even need a question because uh, <laughs> I came prepared uh, for a Kuzmenko uh, discussion at the very least. So I, I think he undersold them. Because in April, his shooting percentage is at 38%. He scored seven goals on 19 shots here this month. He had the hat trick the other night against the Docs. He followed it up with two points the other night against the Coyotes. Had somebody on social say, uh, maybe you want to look at who he scored his goals against uh, as a Calgary Flame. Seven of his 14 goals with the Flames have come against the Sharks or the Ducks. <laughs> so that got me thinking because his last goal as a Canuck, he scored twice in a 7-4 win just before Christmas against San Jose. And I was like, Wow, 7 of 14 is a flame against those two teams. So he had 3 of 8 as a Canuck. You do the math, 10 of his 22 goals this year have come against those two brutal California teams. So context matters here. Uh, he's fun. He was a great guy to deal with. But you know, one thing to absolutely light up the Sharks and the Ducks repeatedly, it's another to come through in crunch time and uh, it's just been a weird year for him and obviously throwing a trade in there as well. But I mean, he's settled in on a line right now that's feeling Nassim Kadri is the third star of the week of the National Hockey League coming in with back-to-back three-point performances. So, you know, if you're the Vancouver Canucks, like, there is a danger factor, right? Like these guys are loose. They got nothing to play for other than padding their own stats. And Kadri's feeling it right now. Kuzmenko's a finisher. So, uh, you know, that's where I say the Flames can be a dangerous team in that regard if the Canucks aren't completely locked in the task at hand but uh you know in terms of grading this trade the Canucks got out from under the final year of the contract that they themselves signed Kuzmenko to prematurely so it's hard to a big pat on the back for getting off a bad contract that you handed out uh sooner than you should have but the fact of the matter is that they did create some gap flexibility that they they needed and again I'm not here to judge the trade now uh, because Kuzmenko is not going to the playoffs and Elias Lindholm is, and we'll see what kind of factor he can be for the Vancouver Canucks. But wouldn't it be something if, you know, the Canucks want the Nashville Predators and ultimately it's a, an overtime or a shootout loss that yields that matchup, tie, go to OT, and then Kuzmenko is the guy that, uh, you know, sets the Canucks in their playoff <laughs> slot here by scoring the overtime winner tonight. Oh, poetry in motion right there, Jeff. And you'll be there to break it all down uh, yeah. live on the Rinkwide Vancouver YouTube channel. It'll be there post game. Going to be a good time, Jeff. I'll see you at the game tonight. I look forward to that. And yeah, Rafan Gafar joining me in studio and we'll break it all down. We'll have the uh, team awards. Obviously, we'll see uh, if we know about the playoffs slot. If not, we'll certainly update the playoff standings at the very least because Vegas is playing 
uh, tonight as well. So there's some action on the out-of-town scoreboard to keep an eye on. So lots going on here in the final week of the regular season, and we'll cover it all off tonight on Rinkwide Vancouver. Jeff, great stuff as always. Thanks so much for joining us. Okay, guys, thanks. There is Jeff Patterson, who, as I mentioned a few times there, you can see on Rinkwide Vancouver post game all through the regular season and, of course, all through the playoffs. Always a good time on Rinkwide Vancouver. Get your interaction and you can interact live in the YouTube live chat, live on multiple platforms, uh, streaming on the CanucksArmy.com Instagram uh, and, again, on the Rinkwide Twitter and YouTube. So be sure to go check it out, Rinkwide Vancouver. Uh, Jeff was some absolute fire. I just, I said Andre Kuzmenko's name and he was just prepared. Honestly, I didn't even know what question I was going to ask Carmen. I, Jeff just comes with the absolute fire. And the reason I bring it up is because Stefan Roger over at Canucks Army wrote an article yesterday about how the Flames should learn from the Canucks mistake and sell high on Andre Kuzmenko when you can. Like, see if there's someone in the offseason that'll take Andre Kuzmenko and I don't think the situations are the exact same they're obviously not uh, with what the Flames are going to be doing next year it's not like the Flames are bringing in a new coach who's not going to mesh well with Kuzmenko but context matters and Jeff brought up some really important context when we discuss Andre Kuzmenko but that's precisely also why it, the even the concept of selling high might be difficult for the Flames in the offseason because if j is finding this don't you think an acquiring team that's interested in Ooh, Kuzmenko's bounced back. They're going to be doing their homework as well. And yeah. we know that teams don't value garbage time production for non-playoff teams as much as when the stakes actually matter. So I'm sure a lot of teams will look at that and go, well, yeah, Calgary's out of it. They're not even close to the playoffs. These games don't have stakes. And he's just sort of feed feasting on bottom feeders. Yeah, we know he's got more offensive upside than what he showed in Vancouver, but he's also probably not not the type of player that is producing at the rate he has been since coming to Calgary. So even the concept of selling high, like I don't know if that's going to be possible just yet. Uh, and you'll sort of have to weigh it up against what does it look like if we hold on, if, if we hold on to him and retain some salary at the deadline um, where his contract might be a little bit more palatable, especially if we retain and as a rental, maybe a team is looking for some secondary scoring and he can be somebody's like Anthony Duclair, obviously totally different style of player, but similar sort of concept in like a sheltered middle six score. Yeah, absolutely. And again, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, you're right, though. Context matters and the teams obviously have that context as well. If we can figure it out, they can figure it out as well. Something we might figure out tonight is who the Canucks will be playing in the playoffs. We might figure that out tonight. And as you gear up for it, we've got you covered because the playoffs are near and we have an army. Nation Gear is ready to gear you up for Vancouver's playoff run. Rep your favorite team as they battle for the cup. Shop the exclusive. We have an army playoff tee and more at nationgear.ca. A. Okay, Harm, let's preview tonight's game. The Calgary Flames visit the Vancouver Canucks, of course. I know Jeff was talking about how the Canucks don't have a ton to play for. And again, that wasn't what he was trying to say. He was just mentioning that, look, like the cadre line and what Calgary has going for them right now. Like they've got some good bright spots for them in this garbage time. And we've seen for years the Canucks, when they don't have anything to play for, when there's no playoffs in sight, like, like the situation that the Calgary Flames are in right now we've seen the Canucks throttle teams that they shouldn't be able to beat so again tonight's not a layup by any means but if I'm the Canucks I'm looking at this one and saying okay we can get this out of the way we can secure the more favorable playoff matchup we can secure the Pacific Division don't even mention the playoff matchup because I know nobody wants to hear that I'm not going to throw it out there anymore you can secure the Pacific Division with a win tonight the players got to be saying okay Let's just get this done so that Thursday really won't mean anything. Yeah, you want to take care of business. And I'll tell you who has something to play for. It's the depth guys that have had have had trouble producing since the All-Star break, right? Because look, for JT Miller, Quinn Hughes, uh, Elias Patterson, maybe less so for him because he hasn't necessarily been at his best since the All-Star break. But for a guy like Hughes or, or Miller or, or Besser, your performance in the next two games doesn't matter. You've had an incredible regular season. Your confidence is going to be high heading into the playoffs, but that may not be true for an Ilya Mikheyev. That may not be true for a Teddy Bluger who hasn't scored in forever. 
uh, or a Vasily Podkolz, at least from an offensive production standpoint. Uh, Pia Suter, Sam Lafferty, like these are the guys that in these last couple of games you want to produce, get on the board a little bit, or, or even if it's not landing on the score sheet with a goal, feel good about yourself. Create some chances, get some swagger back in your game so that by the time you, you get to the playoffs uh, against the Nashville Predators, who aren't as defensively stingy as an opponent like LA or, or Vegas, you actually have some confidence that you can produce. Right. So I think for those depth guys, it like if if I'm again, if I'm Pia Suter, if I'm Teddy Bluger, I want to finish strong. So I feel good about my game offensively uh, heading into the postseason. And this is where against Calgary specifically as well. Keep in mind that because they've dealt Tanev, Hannafin and Zadorov midseason, they've lost half of their starting blue line. Uh, it's basically they've got weaker. And Anderson is their only experienced high and top or defenseman. Besides that, they're experimenting with a lot of younger, inexperienced blue liners. So you've got an opportunity there to take advantage of a blue line that um, that's inexperienced and uh, could be prone to making mistakes. Okay, on the Canucks side, Thatcher Demko starts in goal. What am I looking to see from him tonight? I'm really just looking for him to get some rubber. Like it almost. And again, I don't want to say the game doesn't matter because if you if you, if you are a Canucks fan and in his first game back you see Thatcher Demko get lit up, you're obviously not like, yeah, that's fine, that's great. But going back to that quote we read from that San Jose goalie yesterday. Life goes on. Like, it'll be okay. If, if, if Thatcher Demko doesn't look his best tonight, he'll have Thursday to get after. That's why that's why you want him to have more than just one game. And I know someone brought it up again in the YouTube live chat saying, sit him in Winnipeg. Absolutely do not sit Thatcher Demko against the Winnipeg Jets. This isn't even a discussion in my mind. Like, I, again, the, co the Canucks coaching staff haven't confirmed their plan. We know Demko starts tonight. I would be stunned to see Demko not get the game in Winnipeg. You got to get this guy as much rubber as possible. That's the most important thing, getting him to face shots and feel that game speed. You guys shot with Kevin Woodley on Friday. You can do all the practicing you want. Nothing compares to playing in a game, finding pucks through five bot or 10 bodies, five of which are trying to make you not be able to see the puck. Nothing compares to that. Get that to Demko as much practice as he can. 100%, especially because goal goaltending is so rhythm and flow based and how many goalies speak about how their game reaches a higher level when they consistently get starts right like even scenarios where let's say a backup gets thrust into a starting role for for a little bit oftentimes they'll say well hey it's actually kind of nice to play some games regularly because you're able to get those reps in and now all of a sudden you're not thinking as much when you're when you're on the ice in terms of your reads uh, it feels instinctual. It feels natural. And so, absolutely, I'm in full agreement. Uh, Demko should get both tonight and uh, Thursday against Winnipeg. Okay, anything else you want to get to? It looks like Canucks are going to go with the same lines. Uh, I I'm curious how the Lindholm line looks again. They looked really good on Saturday night. I think that's one thing I'm watching for the playoffs. Power play, penalty kill. Yeah, you're keeping an eye on it. Is there anything you wanted to get to before we get to light the lamp? Uh, no. Okay. Exhilarating. Pre-game report here on Canucks Combo. We'll be going more in-depth, of course, during the playoffs than we are for Game 81 against the Calgary Flames. Well, I'm not but... going to lie. I, like, I'm not going to lie. It is hard to get excited for Vancouver <laughs> versus Calgary Game 81 when you know the playoffs are only a handful of days away. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, Captain Canuck asking this about the playoffs. Uh, what are our plans for the playoffs? Are we going to be doing pre-game shows? We're basically going to be doing what we do now, just the segment where we're talking about the game is going to be a lot, lot longer and a lot more in depth. And Hey, maybe, maybe we fire up, maybe we fire up on a Saturday, depending, depending how we, uh, how we're looking, but I think it's going to stick about the same. We're just going to see kind of, we'll go with the flow of the playoff schedule. Like if their first games on Sunday, we might not have a preview, but man, Monday, Monday is going to be a post game of a playoff game. That's the first one that we're going to do. And we're about to hit episode 600 of this show, Harm. And obviously, you haven't been here for all 600 of them, but you've been here for a bulk of them now because since we've gone to five days a week, you've been here. So it's going to be it's going to be legendary. It's going to be legendary, and I'm very excited for what we're going to be able to do in the playoffs. We're not going to have to look up hockey DB pages, disgrace the deceased like we accidentally did yesterday. It's going to be they're going to be better shows. They're going to be a lot of fun uh talking about the 
uh, games, the, the games that really matter. And of course, that is going to happen in the playoffs. Going to be good. And again, post game, rink wide Vancouver is where you're going to want to check us out. And of course, Carson Price as well. Uh, we've got them as well that we'd like you to check out. Okay. Uh, let's get to Light Lamp brought to you by our friends over at Four Winds Brewing. Vancouver is playing Calgary tonight. We want to know who's going to score the first goal for Vancouver. If you nail it, you could win a $25 gift card to the Four Winds Tap Room located at 72nd and River Road in Delta. Enter by following us on social media. Keep an eye out for today's show clip and comment who you think will light the lamp and score the first goal tonight. Winners will be contacted directly. Check us out at Canucks Army or at Canucks Convo on Twitter, at CanucksArmy.com on Instagram, and Canucks Army on Facebook. And make sure you ask about Four Winds Light, Light Lager at your local liquor store, or have some delivered to your front door through the online shop at fourwindsbrewing.ca. Okay, I am going with Dakota Joshua. Nice. I'm going to say Patterson. It, it feels like he typically has success against uh, Calgary. So I need to figure out what the numbers are for days before a game where Pe Patterson and I have a one on one and then he scores. Because I think it might be high. But I'm just guessing. So we'll see how tonight goes. Well, if he if he does well now, then it might become a ritual. Can you imagine yeah. going going into the playoffs? He needs a one on one chat with you to get him oh, to get him going. I could imagine it because it makes sense. It makes sense. Look, I'll be honest. Very pleasant conversation with Elias Patterson yesterday. We just talk about stick flex a lot. Like those, are, every conversation I have with Elias Patterson is about stick flex, and he knows it's coming too. Like before I sit down next to him in his stall. He knows it's coming. Like he knows it's coming. And yesterday the conversation started with, yeah, it's been a while since I asked about your stick flex. And then he went in depth and we talked for like three minutes about why he's now uh, changed his stick flex again. He's gone with a lighter flex. And um, again, I don't want to give away the whole conversation because I might write about it, but you know, he, he was at such a high flex to start the year and he changed before the all-star break. Uh, he, he, we know when talking to players that I don't want to say they get weaker, during the season but you lose some of your strength in season right because you're not you're not in the gym every day you're playing games every single day basically right or you're on the ice almost every single day you're not in the gym every single day so it's hard to keep up that strength that you built in the off season so for Elise Pedersen he was talking about how it was affecting his stick handling um and different things like that but yeah it's always it's always always a good time when I chat with Elise Pedersen and I, I hope he feels the same I, I I would like to think he feels the same because he always he always says he wants to talk to me so I'm taking that as a compliment. He's always struck me as a guy that's very particular with his equipment because I remember even after his first season, uh, or maybe it was dr or my first season covering the Canucks in 1920, which was his second uh, second season in the NHL. He was talking about, I spoke to him about changing um, his skate profile a little bit. He's always been someone to experiment, tinker, try and find, uh, find that, but whether it's his skates, whether it's a stick, find that optimal piece of gear. And um, it is a very good point that you uh, mentioned about sort of players losing some strength over the course of an 82 game season, especially because of how many calories they burn. Can you imagine over, over the course of a game, how much you're practicing? It's tough to eat enough to retain all that weight. And I think we can all remember, do you remember the Philip Peronic before and after photos of him at the end of last season? His trainer posted like a before and after of him yes. at the end of last season versus at the start of uh, this season heading into training camp. And of course, part of it was lighting made the transformation look even better, but it looked night and day. And um, I think that's just a testament to how strength changes and him and Pedersen sort of adjusting and going to lighter flex um, seems pretty self-aware about that. Another thing from PD and I's conversation yesterday uh, he told me he's most excited for Niels Hoaglander's playoff beard. <laughs> that was one of the questions I asked him. <laughs> Whose playoff beard are you most excited to see? And Hoaglander was sitting right beside us. And he was like, oh, I think Niels over there. And Niels had a good laugh. Speaking of which, I decided, because I, I had to go out on the weekend, Harmon. I know I told you and Grady and all our listeners last week that, yeah, I'll just keep, I'll grow my playoff beard until playoffs. So my facial hair grows a little faster than it ever has before. Like it's starting to grow a little faster. And it's looking more gnarly than it ever has before. Like I was just getting random patches right here. And I was like, I can't just go out like this. Like I look awful. So I shaved before I went to a Vancouver Canadians game on the weekend. And I shaved before going to that game. I, I, Cause I know I said I would do it until 
the Canucks are eliminated. I am starting on game one of the playoffs. I will shave that morning, and then game one of the playoffs from puck drop, I will not shave until the Canucks are eliminated from the playoffs, or they win the Stanley Cup. Whatever happens, I won't shave from there. But I'm not. I'm not adding any extra time to it than I need to. I'm not getting oh, the head on. start. I'll tell you that, dude. This no. is the week of the playoffs. You have to start. I'll tell you this one. I don't think there's a single person on the planet other than you and anybody who you explicitly told that would have noticed that you actually shaved. No, no, no. You would notice. It was bad, dude. And here's the thing. I, I, I explained this last time. Well, because I shaved, but you would notice it grows straight down, man. Like it was like over my <laughs> lip. It was. It looked awful. I had to get it. I had to get rid of it. It was patchy on the sides. It was, oh, this is imaginary, awful. dude. Like you could have. You could have legit told me. Oh yeah, I've been growing for like a week, and it's a little slow. And I've been like, yeah, I don't know. It looks Maybe the same to I'll me. I'll just shave every non-game day and be like, yeah, yeah. Just, uh, just taking a while to grow. Uh, look, man. <laughs> I can't, I can't, I can't. It's, it's, it was looking way too bad. I couldn't do it. So we'll see. We'll see, but I'll do it. I'll, <clears throat> I'll do it for the actual playoffs when the playoffs start. I'm just not, all I'm telling you is I'm not getting a head start. I'm not getting a head start. And I'll tell you, Nils Hugliner, for example, he's getting a head start and he's looking good. It's looking good. It looked good. I like Nils Hugliner's beard. It's starting to look good. But, anyways, <clears throat> let's get to anyone else as we talk about some shenanigans. Let's get to anyone else presented by. DoorDash, it's our listener's chance to get involved and hit us up in the YouTube live chat. And it's also our listener's chance to get 25% off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more when they download the DoorDash app and enter code NATION25. That's all capital letters NATION and the numbers 25. Offer value in Canada, subject to change, terms do apply. With Double Dash on DoorDash, you can order from multiple restaurants or stores in the same delivery without additional delivery fees. So everyone can get what they want and need. That promo code again is NATION25. Five for 25% off and free delivery on your first order with DoorDash. Download the DoorDash app and people in the chat saying ding dong, asking about the beard. Nope, it's coming. It's coming during the playoffs. Okay. And I wouldn't even call it a beard. It was literally just right there on this. Like I had, I had patchy sideburns is what came of it. And then a long mustache. It was gnarly harm. It, it looked bad. Yeah. I That's peach fuzz. Maybe like hardly can call that facial hair, but it, that's the thing. So it, historically it has just been peach fuzz which is great but now it's like long black black brown hairs that are just growing straight out like they're not growing in cl- it, it it's bad dude it's bad we'll we'll see by the time they get to the western conference final hopefully yeah stanley cup final more like all right <laughs> the playoff peach fuzz yep that's right captain canuck as you said harm the peach fuzz coming back but it's long you'll see you'll see it's gonna look it's gonna look gross it's gonna look real gross gross. okay uh okay we had this one this one from vin xd i wanted to get to this one first it's been 10 seasons of the wild card playoff setup are you liking this wild card setup or would you rather we go back to one seed versus eight seed i'm pulling up the nhl standings these would be the playoff matchups if we went back to this and I'll, i'll give you a hint my answer is yes go back to the one through eight The reason I say this is because we were going over the playoff math and we know all this and we broke it down because this is our job. We have to know this. But there were so many people in the chat and to no fault of their own, in my opinion, so many people in the chat just didn't even know what we were talking about when we were saying, okay, well, Nashville's locked in wild card one. People are saying, well, how can that be possible with Vegas being right behind them in LA? And it's because one of Vegas or LA is going to finish as the Pacific the third team in the Pacific and the other is going to finish this wild card too. They can't go into wild card one. So it's just needlessly confusing, I think. So again, we look as we look at the Western conference playoff picture here, it just seems needlessly confusing because your playoff matchups wouldn't be that different and it wouldn't get rid of the spirit of the playoffs. If you had the one through eight matchups. So if the playoffs started today, and we're just going to do the Western Conference, if the playoffs started today with the one through eight setup, Dallas, the division winners would be playing the Vegas Golden Knights, or excuse me, the conference winners right now, if it started today, would be playing the Vegas Golden Knights. With this new system, this new confusing system, they would be playing Vegas anyways. That would be the matchup. The Vancouver Canucks would be playing the LA Kings. The Winnipeg Jets would be playing the Nashville Predators. The Colorado Avalanche would be playing the Edmonton Oilers as the 4-5 seeds. That doesn't break the playoffs in my mind. It doesn't make them 
astronomically better. Like it doesn't make the ma matchups way better or anything like that, but it's way simpler. And I think for that reason, I'm all on board with going back to one to eight. I'm also sick of seeing, like, I don't want to see Edmonton LA for the third year in a row, right? Like it doesn't excite me anymore. Uh, I, for instance, in the Metro, there's a really strong chance that Carolina and the Rangers will make it through just because the wildcard teams in the East um, are weak and Carolina, if they finish second in the Metro, which I, th I think they're locked in to do the third Metro teams probably going to be the Islanders. Anyway, round two is probably going to be Rangers and hurricanes. I've seen that so many times now, right? Or maybe not so many times, but I've seen it before and it, look, it's still going to be a great series, but I, I just don't love the repeats over and over again. And especially with Edmonton, LA, like that series doesn't, inspire a lot of um excitement in me anymore and i get where the nhl was originally coming from in the sense that oh if these teams go up against each other uh, more often there will be these strong rivalries yes. fan bases will get into it that's it um, and i understand that but it just didn't play out in real life the way we thought right like i don't think oilers fans are but like yeah oilers fans like going up against LA because they think they think they're going to win, but otherwise it's not an exciting matchup. And same thing for LA fans. So there's been no like great rivalry that's been born out of these repeat matchups. And 100, they should go back to one to eight. Alec Taylor bringing this up, I like this. Uh, would you go for one to eight with a play in for seven and eight? Yeah, but I also think going back to a previous conversation we had about maybe expanding the playoffs, like I don't I don't hate the idea of a play in round, but I think before I go back to one to eight with a play in for seven and eight, I would just go straight one to eight. I like the straight one to eight and I read out those playoff matchups. Those all seem pretty good to me. And you brought up the Eastern Conference as well, like the playoff matchups in the Eastern Conference would also be pretty good. It doesn't break the spirit of the playoffs. Um you kind of pointed it out there that you're going to have a team like the Islanders going up against the Carolina Hurricanes. Yeah, it's it's fine. And, and again, like another repeat. It is. It is exactly. And even if you go one to eight, they might still have that matchup. But I don't know. I just think it the idea, like you said, was to create these rivalries. Right. But. It just hasn't gone the way we expected, like you said, and I think you would have different matchups and different looks. And I just think it would be more interesting as one to eight. That's just my opinion. I think the uh, majority of players uh, would probably prefer that uh, as well, to be totally honest with you. Do you think there's any players? I actually, I know there has to be, I was going to say, do you think there's any players that don't know how the matchup really works for playoffs? <laughs> I don't want to speculate. There has to I be. I don't know either I, way. There, I, there has to be. I mean, there's hundreds of players, right? Not going to name names, but I have a few players in my mind that I would just go up to and be like, can you explain the playoffs to me and expect them to just be like, no. I'm not well, also, say like, <laughs> no one will admit it, but some guys do treat it like a nine to five job, right? Yeah. Like oh, where yeah. it's where they don't love hockey, but they're really good at it. It pays a lot. And so because in season, there's already such a strong time commitment and because you're mentally on so often all they care about is on the ice. And as soon as they leave the rink, they want to turn their brain off and they don't want anything to do with hockey. Absolutely. And I mean, Hey, not to bring it back to baseball, but we've seen a guy like Anthony Rendon fly too close to the sun with that. I'll tell you about Anthony Rendon another time, but you're right. Harm. You're absolutely correct. Uh, this one, again, people are bringing up the single game play in, you and I have both discussed this and I don't think either of us like the idea of a single game play in hockey's just too random. Hockey's too random to have a single game play. And I know you agree with that take. So we'll jump to the next thing that I wanted to bring up. Where was it? Somewhere here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Harm. So it's going to be time soon for us to bring up playoff brackets and create some playoff brackets of our own right now. It sure looks like the Toronto Maple Leafs are going to face off against the Florida Panthers or the Boston Bruins in round one which means the Toronto Maple Leafs are getting bounced in the first round. I'll, I'll be honest, though. I don't think Boston's as good as a rec regular season record indicates. I don't if think Toronto's up, ever as good as their regular season indicates. Yeah, but one thing you have to keep in mind is we haven't seen it yet, obviously, but could, 
all it would take is Matthews going beast mode once, and I think he could single-handedly beat the Bruins. Again, he hasn't done it yet, and maybe he's just not a playoff performer, not a guy that can translate that same level of regular season dominance to the postseason. Um, but I don't know, man. I look at Boston, and I'm just still not fully convinced on them, right? Especially because that's a team where they've been so reliant on a big chunk of their success is, okay, we're dominant on both special teams. Uh, but then you look at it, and their power play ranks in the 20s since the All-Star break. It's been struggling. So if you take away Boston's power play from the equation, um, now all of a sudden, especially offensively, they don't look that deep. I mean, they've got Danton Heinen playing on their first line, right? Like, we we spend so much time talking about, okay, well, their center depth isn't the best without Bergeron and Krejci, but even on the wings, they're not that deep. They have Danton Heinen playing on the, playing on the top line. Uh, I believe they only have one player in Pasternak who has hit 70 points. Like, I don't think, I think Marshawn might be at 69 points. I'm going to look it up right now um, to verify. He's at 67 points, right? So they're, I'm not as convinced on, on Boston as, uh, as their point totals would indicate. And if anything, like Jim Montgomery, their head coach deserves some, you know, credit for, um, you know, them continuing to have some success given that they're, you know, I like their blue line. I like their goaltending, but especially up front, they don't have a great team. I think that's fair. I just am giving you the vibes pick that like after what happened last year, they're going to be hungry. I just think they're going to be hungrier than the Leafs. I mean, everybody's hungrier than the Leafs when it comes playoff time, but I really think the Bruins are going to be hungry and look like Florida obviously is the tougher matchup. I would say, I think we both agree with that. Um, I just think whatever the case, like no matter what, and we're going to fill up playoff brackets when they're actually set. I just can already tell you, I have Toronto getting bounced in the first round. I don't care who they're facing. Yeah. If it's, um, look, if it's Florida, Toronto, it's Florida's I'm picking Florida for sure. In five. Boston, Toronto, obviously Boston has a historical, uh, advantage of, uh, of sort of living rent free in, uh, in Toronto's, um, mine there. Might still give the edge to Boston. I'll, I'd have to think about that deeper. But if it's, let's say, Boston versus Tampa, like I'm calling it now, I'm going to pick Tampa, even though Tampa's the wildcard team there. I like it. I like that. All right. Because, yeah, I, like, be fun. yeah, I won't get into the full explanation, but it's, it's like the one thing Boston's amazing at, again, is both special teams. The Lightning are even better at both special teams, right? They do Boston's strength better than Boston. And if you then just look at five on five, uh, especially since they've added Anthony Duclair, who's been a slam dunk fit for them, they're deeper um, defensively. They've been much better than they were like two months ago. I looked at Tampa and I thought, man, they don't have any secondary scoring. They're so leaky defensively. Like, I think they're done. But last, you know, since the all-star break, they've really started to find their game again, find their game again. And yeah, I probably... Because look, you can't when you do a playoff bracket, you can't just pick the favorite seed in um in every matchup. That's just a boring bracket. Like you have to pick some type of uh, um upset, and I know one that I'll be leaning towards is Tampa or Tampa over Boston if that ends up being the matchup. I love it. I love it, Harmon. We're gonna have those playoff brackets coming soon when the playoffs finally get set, and hopefully we find out when games are. Like I've had so many Canucks fans text me and ask. Um, you know, message me. I shouldn't say text, but message me and say, when is game one? Like I bought game one tickets and I don't know when it is. Get that schedule out, NHL. Tell people when their tickets that they bought are for people having prior engagements that they got to get to. I got a friend who bought tickets and he's got a final exam and he doesn't know if he's going to be able to make it to the game or not. I'd skip the exam personally, but I don't know. It's, it's his call. So um, we'll see. We'll see when it starts, but it's going to be good. And before we get there, of course, two games left starting tonight against the Calgary Flames. Can I clinch, folks? By this time tomorrow, Harm, we could be talking about a round one matchup with those Nashville Predators. But we'll see what happens tonight. We'll close it out there. For my co-host, Harmon Dial, and our technical producer, Grady Sass, my name is Dave Quadrelli. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Canucks Conversation.
Canucks conversation with Harmon and Quads brought to you by the Toyota BZ4X. The BZ4X's fresh look is just an added bonus to its range since you can drive up to 406 kilometers on a single charge. That's enough to get you from Kitsilano to Whistler or Kamloops to Kelowna and back and still be home in time for the game. Now that's what we'd call electric. The best part, by choosing electric, you can get up to $11,000 in rebates and incentives The BZ4X are in stock and selling quickly, so make sure to visit shoptoyota.ca or your local Pacific Toyota dealer to get your hands on one. Canucks Conversation is live Monday through Friday, every weekday at 2 p.m. over on the Canucks Army YouTube channel. Make sure you like, subscribe, and interact in the YouTube live chat every day with us, folks.